Thanks for coming, everybody. So indeed, uh, my story, what I'll tell you is I'll share you, with you um, what we learned over the last two years or so at Basho, right where we make React. And uh, in this journey, we learned a bunch of lessons. Some things worked, some things didn't. So as per the title, hopefully you'll walk away with it from this talk with some ideas about lessons that you could apply, trying to figure out how to integrate NoSQL stores into Spark. So I got a fair amount to cover, so I'll dive right in. Um, so I'll start with an equation. And the equation here is you have NoSQL. And starting with you know, the, the normal flavors, and as Wes mentioned, you know, we're a key value store. So a lot of what I'll focus on and what we learned to do was optimizing key value for Spark. So you take this equation, you have your NoSQL database and you have Spark, and what do you wind up with becomes a bit of a uh, question mark, right? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think a lot of folks in this room have been through this experience trying to figure out how am I going to marry these two worlds which don't always necessarily speak the same language. So the crux of it is going to be, and too often you're going to wind up with this unhappy face, right? Um, and the crux of this conversation is going to be how do we turn this frown and turn it upside down, right? So hopefully in half an hour we'll see how to do that. So we built a connector, right? So a big part of what we did here was we built a connector between React and Spark. Um, and a lot of what we, and it, it impacted both what we did in the connector itself, but also what we did in the core product of React. And here are our five lessons. So this will be the agenda for this discussion. First of all, it's this idea of, of parallelize, right? Anybody who's worked with Spark knows that it loves to parallelize. So that was for us the number one thing to do, was figure out, okay, how can we maximize parallelization? The second one was this idea of mapping smartly. Whoop, let me go back to the mapping smartly. So in this case, it's mapping data mapping, right? So once you get data across, how are you going to make that as efficient as possible to work with it in Spark, right? So you've taken it out of a key value store, out of NoSQL. How are we going to do that as, as, as easily as possible in Spark? The third is going to be optimize, sort of optimizing all the layers, optimizing all the things. And we spent a lot of time and energy thinking about optimization. Four and five are slightly different because those are really about deployment and uh, how do you simplify the actual use of what we've built, right? Because building connectors, building libraries, using libraries isn't always the easiest thing in the world. So to level set, Re React has been around for a while, right? We're a distributed no, uh, no SQL key value store modeled on the old uh, Anima, Amazon Dynamo paper. We have a very large uh, client base in the enterprise, but a lot of open source projects. We have, it's primarily an Erlang shop. So we're Erlang, C++, some client libraries, and about eight or nine different languages. Um, we are a distributed company in the sense of we have about 40 core engineers on the team, and they're all over the world. We don't have a headquarters in terms of engineering. So, and we are hiring, by the way. So if you want to work remotely on some interesting, really hard distributed systems problems, talk to us afterwards. Um, and it's open source. And we, of course, as many vendors do, we have uh, enterprise features such as multi-data center replication. So that's React. So we started to see, and when this journey started for us, it was about two years ago, customers starting to ask for things like time series, IoT data, analytics, more metrics, right? So those use cases then made us, from a product perspective, think more about what should we be doing, and we did two things primarily. One is we built a whole new product called React TS, which is React time series, so it's optimized for time series data. And then the other thing we did was build the Spark React connector. So those of you, some of you here are familiar with React KV. It's great for high volume throughput on user data, session data. Um, it's used by the National Health Service, Uber, uh, Best Buy, where you need to have high volumes of. So time series data, as you, many of you know, is going to be slightly different. Um, and so the use cases for that were IoT, metrics, and so on. But they use the same React core infrastructure, right? So that same infrastructure is still there, the same backend. So we use LevelDB and BitCast and a couple other pluggable backends that you can use there. Um, 
And if you think about what was ne necessary to change for time series, for us, that meant adding more structure to it. So with time series, it's not just key value, it's you actually have a schema. You can say create table. So there's more structure here, and this will play into some of what I show you later in terms of some of the architectural decisions that we made. Um, along with that, then there's that subset of SQL, so you can do selects and joins and aggregations um, within the time series product. And then lastly, a lot of this is getting optimized for this rapid incoming stream of data. So it's optimized for high write volumes and then queries based on time slice. And so we'll talk about that because again, you think about Spark, they fit well together. And one good example of somebody who's using the time series product right now are the guys at IntelliCore. And I don't know whether anybody in the audience is familiar with um, Formula E racing. So it's formula car racing, but they're all electronic now. So, um, and they go to zero to 103 seconds. It's street racing. It's a company called IntelliCore built a commercial product for those race teams using React TS as the back end. And they do, they're set up to do about 40,000 TPS, but there's a fair amount of telemetry that comes from those races in real time. And then they have real time apps that you can, put, that the race teams themselves use, and then they can distribute that out. So there's a fair amount of processing going on and a fair amount of data in and out in real time. And here's what that app looks like. Um, so again, this is from IntelliCore for this Formula E racing. Um, so the second bit of background I want to give you is the Spark connector. So we did the first version, was published last fall, and the most recent one, 1 1.6, came out last month. So it's fairly new, the, the 1.6. Uh, it's a Scala app. Um, you can download it just like React, it's, it's open source. Um, support Spark 1.6, we're working on Spark 2.0. And we all, it also supports Scala and Python, um, Java, in terms of actually using it. So three use cases, read, write, and streaming. And I'll sort of go into each of these in more detail, right? Reading, pulling that data out, that's the number one use case. You can write back from Spark if you need to. And then you can make React a sync for a streaming scenario. And when we built the connector, we built the connector based on what we had learned building other connectors, so to Solar, to Mesos, to, to Redis, so for, for caching on the, on the Redis side. So lesson number one, parallelize whenever possible. And I'll walk you through a couple of uh, scenarios here that don't work. Here's a React cluster on the left, right? You got the Spark cluster on the right. And the operative question is going to be, how am I going to move a boatload of data from the React cluster over to Spark as quickly as possible? Um, and if you think about it, a KV, K, value, K, K value store, the most common way to do that is you're going to do a get, right? You're going to have a key. You're going to say, give me the value. So if you look at the way that works here, you can have the Spark workers go off. You have a cluster. Each one will go off, and it'll say, give me some, you know, do a get and a get and a get. And they'll get all that data back, and the next node will get the data back. But the problem is, is that the Spark side quickly becomes unhappy, right? Because you're asking the Spark side to do a boatload of work. React is totally happy. It's a key value store. It'll do that till, till the cows come home, right? So the moral of that lesson, which I would call lesson 1A, is too many gets make Spark unhappy. So that's one. Let's try the flip side of that, which is using a secondary index on the React side. So to use that secondary re index, you'll have a Spark worker go over to a coordinating node on the React side. So that, that node in the cluster says, OK, here's my query. Let me go figure out how to get that data as efficiently as possible. So that then goes off to other nodes, knowing where that data is distributed, and pulls that back and then sends that back to Spark. The next Spark worker will go off and do the same thing. right? And the third one will do the same thing. And I think you might be able to guess sort of where the bottleneck becomes in this scenario. It's on the React side, right? Because now we're asking them to do all the work. And that's lesson 1B, which is that too many 2i queries makes React unhappy, right? So we've, we've sort of burdened on the right-hand side. We've burdened on the left-hand side. So what's the solution? The solution is going to be what we call a coverage plan plus parallel extract. So the way that this works is Spark worker makes the request over to React and says, OK, here's what I need. Here's my query. It, 
React comes back with what we call a coverage plan, which is going to be a list of nodes which says where that data is stored within the cluster. Right? So that's the coverage plan. Now that the Spark side has that, that can then in turn be distributed using, again, the Spark React connector. And that guy can then turn around and say, oh, each one of those can in parallel, because it knows exactly which nodes to go to. And when we gave that coverage plan back, that coverage plan tried to optimize it so it was going to the fewest number of nodes. Right? So in this case, we've tried to make the, take the best of both of those worlds of what's great on the React side, what's great on the Spark side, and parallelize and use this parallel extract on the coverage plan to make everybody happy. Right? So for us, that was sort of lesson number one. How can we maximize? That took a fair amount of engineering to, to make that work. Number two is the mapping piece, right? So now we're, we've sort of tried to tackle that question of moving a lot of data over as efficiently as possible from one to the other. Um, and in, and in, in, in React, you'll have that classic key value store, but we also, again, have this time series data. And that comes in as a, a bunch of different formats, right? It could be, as you know, almost anything. Um, but, but the Spark side really wants to have RDDs, it wants to have data frames, and the 2.0 wants to have data sets, right? The more structure, the better, right? Um, and so how are we going to get that whole process working as efficiently as possible? This is what we were trying to, to make happen. So I'll show you sort of how that works. One more bit of background, right? Those of you who don't know how React works, it's got key value, but we also, those are grouped into buckets, which are effectively virtual namespaces. Right? It doesn't necessarily control where they get placed in the cluster, but it gives you a way of identifying them. And in particular, you can then set properties such as replication factors and consistency, consistency attributes in the bucket. So, and that'll show up in a second. So in this case, you're gonna say, the way the connector works is you'll specify a bucket, you'll load the data into an RDD. Um, and an RDD is the, the most fundamental basic unit of computation on the Spark side. So to make that work, here's what it would look like in a little bit of Scala code. So the first step is I'm gonna say, here's my bucket, I'm gonna specify that namespace, and then I'm gonna make that call in, again, Scala, and then at the end there, you'll see that the last item is query all. So it says, give me everything in that bucket, and then I'll work with that over here in Spark. Right, so this is part of the idea of allowing Spark to do what it does best. And depending on how you've done your data modeling, you know, part of the recommendation here is you've thought you know, strategically about how am I, what, what query patterns am I gonna have and how am I gonna set up my buckets to optimize for those. And we'll come back to that. And there are a bunch of other ways you can query that data, right? So you can query it based on keys. So here's Alice and Bob and Charlie as keys to get them that way. There's the two I range where you give a numeric range and it'll get those out. And then, or by just a set of strings that says, this last one here says, you know, get me January and February, right? But the idea is you wind up with a bunch of RDDs in Spark, and then you can work with them over there. And the way that, you know, we were thinking about that, that's fine, that'll work, that, that gets you going. Um, but again, we're talking about how to do this better. And in our use case, and I think maybe for a lot of folks here, certainly in our customer member base, they store it as JSON, right? So the value in the key value is JSON. And so that what that allows us to do is we can tell Spark how to interpret that. So we're doing some interpolation and a retrospection, introspection on the way out to do this more smartly. So I'll show you how that looks. And what we wind up with is data frames, which is a, a, a higher level computational, more structured unit in Spark, right? So often you'll want to be in data frames as opposed to RDDs, right? This is a good thing. So to make that in code, you see that there's one more step here. First of all, we've specified a bucket uh, the second step here is where we do a case class in Scala. And so we're going to say we have uh, an ID, a name, and an H, right? That, that's what's in our schema, or in, in our JSON data, I should say. And that next line in, in under load data is exactly the same, right? But the, the difference part is that very last part where I can say 2DF on what I got back. So I got back an RDD, was that, which is that set. And then I can say 2DF, and then I'm working with a much more, you know, often a preferable place to be in Spark, which is data frames. So we've done uh, those three steps in, in key value, right? So you said specify where, where to go get it, I'm gonna get it, and here's how I'm gonna map the schema, and then I'm gonna get back. But if you look at time series data, which I alluded to before, for us, it's different. What's different about time series for us is that it already has a structure, right? We did a create table, right? 
Um, and so what that's going to allow us to do is that we can then do automatic schema discovery. And that allows us to then, in turn, skip that middle step. So we can go straight from specifying a bucket to loading the data. But what we have when we've loaded the data is we have data frames. So when you do that, what you wind up with, and this is a slightly longer piece of code because I'm going to show you a couple other details. First of all, because it's time series data, in our case, you specify a table name. So at the top, we're not specifying a bucket. We're specifying a table name. And in that context read option there, we specify, as you can see, the, where to go get it. It could be a list of hosts in the cluster, or you can specify one. The format, and then the load, and we're already doing a select. And you can see here, we're already starting to use some of the SQL capabilities in the time series data to pull that back out. Um, and then we can filter it. And then you can do things. And this is where you know, those of you who haven't used Spark, but most of you probably have here, you can start to do much more intelligent things. So I can do a where, right? I can select. I can group by. I can do all those other things, which I wouldn't necessarily do as intelligently if I were doing it in RDD, right? So by moving that up one level, we've been trying to be smarter about that mapping of the schema that we've brought over, right, and make that fewer steps to try and get that back and make that usable on the Spark side. Those of you who might want to do this yourself, um, Spark architecturally has a, uh, a data store layer. And they have an interface that you can implement to build a library like this yourself. So I think there are three interfaces in, in to do in there. I think we did two of them. Um, so that's where a lot of the magic happens underneath the covers in terms of doing this translation and pulling this data in. Is we've implemented the Spark data source API. So that's the second lesson. The third lesson for us was, and I think this is also where we sort of dive into a bit more general, this the idea of optimization, right? So let's optimize all the, all the layers, really. It's, it's optimize all the things, all the layers. And we'll start with this idea of, for React, we have two primary interfaces. You either can use HTTP or you can use protocol buffers. And this has been true for eons, I mean, it's really since the product launched. One's about flexibility. One's about performance, right? And those are just a level set. I think most folks know, but protocol buffers, right, is a, you know, it's a serialization interchange format developed by Google. You specify your IDL. It makes RPC calls. But at the end of the day, it's a binary wire format, right? Lots of language support. And in, and in, and in React, you don't have to necessarily worry about that because there are client libraries that nine times out of 10 you'll be using, and all that dirty goo has been hidden from you anyway. But it does play into some of the optimizations. First of all, folks often want to know, well, how much faster is protocol buffers than using HTTP? So we've done a bunch of performance testing. And on average, it's between 150% to 300% faster to use protocol buffers than to use HTTP. Right? So that's a noticeable difference. So if you look at this diagram, going back to that first lesson, right, on pulling that data across, that's what's happening underneath the covers there as that Spark connector is going over between the clusters, right? All that data is being transferred as protocol buffers. And as we started doing this, we started having some folks try this out. We realized there was a place that we could make this faster. The protocol buffers was great, but we could also do this thing called, that we think of as optimized binary. Um, are there any Erlang programmers in here? Two, three, yeah. So underneath the covers with Erlang, you can do something called term to binary or binary to term, which is their own serialization format. And so since we're primarily an Erlang shop, that's what we do underneath the covers. So what happens is that when you make a call, you make a query to in Spark saying, here's the data I want. If you happen to be making certain types of calls, the driver itself will say, oh, wait a minute, I'm not going to use, I'm not going to use protocol buffers. I'm going to use term to binary. I'm going to use this other optimized format. And that's really for these calls around fetching, querying, things that are closer to bulk operations, in particular where we can make them more efficient on the server side. So we don't see that much benefit to doing this on, say, the Java side or the Scala side when you're making the call itself. But we see a much better benefit on the server side if we're getting that data and then sending it back to Spark. And that's to the order of 30 to 50% better. So again, that's not negligible, right? That is a meaningful difference depending on the amount of data that you're trying to pull across. So you have that sort of tier of HTTP as, as a transport or as a protocol there, 
going up to protocol buffers to make that faster, and in this case, for the right set of calls, thinking about how can I make those faster, right? So those were our primary uh, lessons at that level. Another two more use case optimizations I just want to throw out there to think about. First of all, um, is this idea of full bucket read, which I showed you earlier, right? That you could say query all, and we did a query all, it's gonna go around the cluster and do um, a full bucket read. So that's a relatively newer feature for, for React, because then you don't necessarily have to have that list of keys, you don't have to maintain that list of keys somewhere, you just happen to know, oh, I've named this bucket with this virtual namespace, and that's what I need. So again, in terms of your data modeling, thinking about what's my query pattern gonna be, and then optimizing my bucket structure for that as well. It doesn't necessarily change data locality within the cluster. That doesn't really change, but it really does help on the uh, query side. React TS, on the other hand, does change the way the data gets laid out in the cluster, right? Because when you're thinking about time series data, locality of reference really makes a difference. So all that streaming, time, often time-based data coming in, you wanna lay it as close as possible as you can to the last data. So I'll give you a couple examples. So on the, on the left-hand side, you have a classic key value query, right? You're gonna or put, in this case, where we're gonna write the data, and based upon how it got hashed, it'll get evenly distributed around the cluster, and any node can handle it. It's masterless, right? So React is set up as a masterless architecture so that it's not sharded. Um, but those puts get consistently hashed around the cluster. Time series distributes the data, but it's often looking at grouped based on time quanta. So when you design your data model, you think about how much data do I have coming in when, and what, how, well, I should group this by a minute, an hour, a day. What is that logical grouping mechanism in order so I can lay that data off around the cluster in order both to, to speed up my writes, but also to speed up my reads. And then here's a get. So the get does the same thing as the put in the sense of oh, I know what this query is coming in from Spark, therefore I'm gonna make sure that I've, you know, I know where to go get it faster, right? It's gonna be on the same cluster, the same node. Here's how you would define that as a schema. And I sort of call this out mostly because if you sort of look towards the bottom there, so here's a weather structure. But you'll see it's got region, state, and quantum. And that quantum piece has time, two, and H. So it says, I want those, if at all possible, to be put on the same V node or the same physical node in my cluster because I know what my data pattern is going to be so for both either puts and or gets. I'm reading and writing that data. That's how I'm going to optimize some of my time series data. Right? And uh, again, this, is, this quantum is the, the key to tunable performance. Um, and then to query it out, you could say select star from weather where city is equal to New York and, and pull that out, right? So that's how that query might look. So it's very SQL-like, unlike traditional key value store, right? But it's also optimized for pulling it out. In this case, I said give me a day, right? But depending on what, what it is you're intending to do with it over on the Spark side, you know, your mileage may vary. You choose what that should look like. Lesson number four this idea of being flexible. So in many ways, this is a bit less technical of, a, of an optimization here or a, you know, a, a lesson because it's about, for example, in, in Sparkland, these are the languages that you really care about for the most part, right? So as we were building this, we were making sure that we had tested it in all, you know, all three of these. We had used it in Jupyter Notebooks, so we had used it from Spark, from you know, Scala apps, Java apps, Python apps to make sure that all of these were supported. So if you're building these for either for your, you know, not just for your own team's use, but for your organization's use or, or third party, it really behooves you to think about this kind of flexibility as to how am I gonna allow people to consume this as easily as possible. So for us, it was these three languages. Um, and here's a quick example of Python to pull that together, right? So the Python example, you have, you're sort of saying, again, where's my cluster? I'm gonna set up the context in Spark. Um, I'm gonna, here's an example of writing the data. So I'm gonna parallelize it. Um, and I'm gonna save it to React, right? So it's really not that hard. And then the read, again, isn't gonna be all that wildly different than what I showed you before. And again, I'm doing the query all. Um, and there's two of the earlier lessons that are sort of implicit in here, right? Because you can see that in number two here, in the right, it says uh, parallelize, right? So you're taking that 
that list of data, and I'm going to say, okay, when I do the write here from Spark, I want that to be done in parallel. I mean, granted, it doesn't matter with, a, with you know, two or three items, but we're talking about volume. It does matter. And the same as the query all, right? So again, thinking about how to apply the earlier lessons, whatever language we're working in. Another bit of flexibility is streaming, right? I alluded to that in the beginning that we support streaming, so this is the classic Spark diagram from them about what streaming looks like in, in the Spark world, right? You take things out of Kafka queues or whatever in your data pipeline, pump it into Spark, and then you can push that back out. So React can be a sync. So part of what this connector does is thinking about, okay, how can we be in sync for that data? And so here's an example of what that looks like in code. Uh, you set it up, you set up the context. By the way, uh, uh, these don't know Spark that well, that seconds is how big a batch I want to pull out of that stream. So as I'm sort of pulling those windows out of the stream, in this case, I'm saying, give me one second's worth. And then I pull that back out and I get the lines back out and then I can filter them and then I can save them back, right? So, but again, it's the same idea of what are the primary use cases in Spark? What are the primary use cases for me in, in my organization or my app when, as I'm sort of connecting these two worlds to wind up with a happy face? Um, a couple other flexibility notions real quick are, you know, for both Spark and React and many of the tools you use, right? You can do it in any one of these flavors. But it's not always obvious which one makes the most sense. So for example, here's the idea of co-locating the two, right? So on the left-hand side, you have Spark and React working on the same nodes. You could do that. Um, it's not required, certainly by our connector. But I think quite often that's not a good idea, right? Spark is a memory-hungry beast. It wants as much horsepower as you can possibly give it, right? Um, that model on the right is more flexible because, okay, there, granted, I'm giving each one more horsepower, right? More memory, more CPU, depending on what my boxes look like, right? On the left, you're gonna need bigger, more vertical boxes, I think. On the right, it's easier to do with more commodity boxes. Um, and on the right, um, you know, again, you're gonna have to you pay that price of pulling that data across, depending on how, how, what your network looks like. But you can do it the other way, right? Again, it depends on what your configuration looks like and which one ends up being a, a better scenario. But I think more often in our testing, it's gonna be that sort of linearly scalable configuration on the right. And one last flexibility item is this idea of using Meso. So uh, we've also built an open source uh, framework for connecting React to Mesos. So you can sort of pull all these together and run this on a Mesos cluster if you want to do that. So another bit of open source software that we built in the last year. And last but not least, this idea of simplification and how do I reduce friction? And I'll just throw out a couple of quick ideas here. First of all, uh, Spark packages. So sparkpackages.org allows you to deploy as, you know, as a repository for the libraries uh, in this case, well, any library, any, in our case, it's the connector. So if you look down here, sort of two thirds of the way down, you'll see we're invoking Spark shell, and it says uh, dash dash packages. And that just can, in your cluster, that'll magically pull down those packages from Spark packages, and so that just saves you some deployment headache in managing all of this. So we've found Spark packages to be a great place to, to put this up. And then, you know, a library usage is often only as good as the docs behind it. So we partnered with da the Databricks guys. And so we have a notebook, a, sort of a Jupyter style or a Databricks style notebook up on Spark that allows you to sort of walk through and make all this work interactively just by using a notebook. But I think those are examples of figuring out how to be sort of flexible and simplifying the actual usage of whatever you, in this case, what we built, which is the Spark tool. And I'll throw in one last bonus lesson, which is don't die. Um, and for us, as you know, servers die in clusters all the time. So in this case here, if a React node dies during data retrieval as we're pumping all this stuff back and forth, um, the Spark connector will go back and get what we call an alternative coverage plan. So that'll say, okay, well, you're not getting it from that node. Here's a better plan for getting that data as quickly and efficiently as possible. So those are lessons uh, just for us, where we're going next. And I think this is true for a lot of people working in the Spark world. Um, Spark 2.0, uh, which has data sets and structured streaming. So those are two really interesting pieces for us. So that's what we're looking to do. And then really going back to our original question, right? If this is the equation, how do you get 
turn that frown upside down. For us, it was these five lessons. And that's my talk, and keep it, we're, we're hiring. Thanks. And there's office hours shortly, so we'll also be able to talk over there. I have a two-part question. Uh, first is, uh, I know you talked about how you optimized uh, the KV and TS for Spark. Any plans to do that for the S2? Or for the S2? We oh, have for, the S2? for the S2? Yeah. yeah, so we're looking at that as well, because for those of you who don't know, that's our big object storage, and you may be a user of that. And uh, so we're looking as to how to do that as well. Okay. I mean, obviously, a different set of optimizations we're going to have to make because you're going to have to chunk them, right? We're talking about objects which could be you know, gigabytes in size. So the strategy will have to be slightly different. OK. And second part is, uh, is more about React in general. Um, how big a cluster can React go to? Because I mean, is, are you guys using Erlang distribution, or are you, did you write your own libraries? Because Erlang distribution is more of every node knows about each other, right? Yeah. So. Um, the, in terms of the architecture for React, yeah. um, a lot of that was borrowed originally in you know, 2008, 2009 when we first built it from that Amazon Dynamo. So there's, it uses a gossip protocol to keep all those nodes in sync, and it does use the distributed Erlang underneath the covers. So you know, it's trying to use the best of what Erlang provides, but also those same principles that were outlined in the original sort of Dynamo ideas about replication and clustering and quorums and consistency. Is that Answer how big question? a cluster have, have you seen this being used used for? How, how many nodes in the cluster? Like maximum amount that you have seen? Uh, I don't know. Uh, 100? Okay. 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 Sure. Thanks. Yeah, another big use case for us with the weather company does <laughs> enormous volumes of data with React as a back end. Yeah, at, at, at Sharpie, we, we got up, I, I think our peak was something like 70 nodes, and we didn't really notice any sort of problems with having that number of nodes. Yeah, I mean, it was a fundamental it, principle. It was going to be linearly scalable with that consistent hashing. Uh, okay, great. Oh, I, I have uh, one kind of a detailed question. So uh, uh, when, when the Spark cluster gets the coverage uh, plan, what happens if the location of the data like changes in, you know, like in that time period, like um, you, you know, like a new node comes in or something, and you know, yeah, so it comes back to the alternate, co the alternate coverage plan. Um, okay, so it's the same, same case as if a node dies or something. Yeah. Okay.